When we think about the church, some people have the concept of, you know, what is the purpose of this building? Why is there a Parkview Church of Christ right out here on Fairmont? And a lot of people may drive by. There's people in the neighborhood. They, they just kind of say, well, there they are. But I wonder what they do. Are they supposed to be someone that helps people in times of tornadoes and times of damage? Or they, there's some people that are kind of do their good works. Is that the, the work that the, the church does? What is our purpose? Why do we have a baptistry behind me? That's what it is. Well, we find in God's word that we're to baptize people, we're to preach the gospel, and it is an expedient way of accomplishing something that maybe you'd have to go to a swimming pool or go to a river. And we have enough people here. I know I couldn't get you in my house to this morning. And we have a place where many people can come. And it's all related to exactly what our work is when we're together and acting together as a church. So this morning I want to explore that with you. And the first thing that we need to understand is when we talk about a church, it is a collective noun, like flock. That's not one sheep. It's a group of people that are gathered together with a purpose of being the part view church of Christ. It's a local church. We're baptized into the body of Christ, and that is the church in its universal sense, that we all are brothers and sisters, though we not, might not be in the same locality. But when it comes to the work of the church, I hope you're impressed this morning that the New Testament says that was done on the local level. Elders were on a local level. Elders in every church is how the, the apostles they appointed plurality of men, not just one, plurality of men in every church doing our own work. But what is that work? I want us to see when we talk about the church and its collectivity doing something, you might realize that it might be done as they work through a, a treasury, as we'll see. How can we all act in unison and get something done unless there's so, well, we'll provide the funds to get it done. Maybe someone else will do that work. But when we talk about a church, is that we're doing something together as a collective. I work at the church, not well, my individual responsibility, but the work of the church. I want to begin there to realize that we're working together locally. It's a local church. How do we operate? How do we get things done that's according to, to God's word. So we realized that there was indeed a local church in Corinth. We'll see this morning. They were involved in a work. There was a local church that we find in Philippi. We just read, Joshua read for us, and what they were doing in regard to the Apostle Paul. There was a local church that we see in Ephesus. They were involved in their work together. And as we see in the New Testament, the book of Acts, we see there was a church in Antioch. Those were local churches and localities, each one doing their own work. And we want to examine what that work was. We want to make sure we understand what our work here is at, at Parkview. So how did they go about getting that work done? I want to begin that sometimes the work of the church was supported through the church's treasury. We gave of our means as we've been prospered this morning and realize we're going to use that according to God's way of how the church is to be involved in using its money. Well, one thing we see in the New Testament that indeed the work of benevolence was to be taking place. That's helping Christians in need. That's what the church was involved in doing. Let's see if we can establish that in the word of God. For example, in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, we see that Paul has commanded churches in Galatia, other local churches, but he commanded them, as he does now, to the church in Corinth. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, it was a collecting money for the benefit of who? Saints, those are Christians. 
Those are Christians that may be in other areas. But it was for them. And as, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, so also do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by in store as he may prosper that no collection be made when I come. He wanted things to be expedited. He wanted, they've been prepared. Now he wants them to make sure they, they have it ready for him. So you have it accumulated. It's not I'm laying aside in my house. He'd have to go to every house. But they had it in a place where he could come and get that. But they were having a collection. And it was for the saints. And as we read our New Testament, other passages say who those saints were, as we'll see in Romans, the 15th chapter. But here's the treasury. Here's a church at work, not an individual at work. Here's a church. How, would, how will all of us work together, unified in one place, in one area? It's working through the treasury of that's why how the church uses its money is very important to understand. There was the fellowship that was taking place and sharing their money with the people in their need. They were ministering to the saints in need. For example, the same contribution in the second epistle to Corinthians, Paul writes, beseeching us, here were the Church of Macedonia, beseeching us with much entreaty in regard of this grace and the fellowship in the ministering to whom? Not just everybody in the world, but to saints, ministering to the saints. And not as we had hoped, but they first gave their own selves to the Lord and us through the will of God. So they wanted to participate in this. That was, a, that was encouraging. And Paul would say, let me explain to you, Paul said, I want equality. Well, that, that means we don't have a treasury that everybody uh, you know, just contributes there and we, don't, and we don't have individual possessions so we can have equality? No. Listen to how he describes this in verse 14. That, but by equality, what do you mean, Paul? Your abundance being a supply at this present time for their want. You have money, they don't. They are going through a famine, they're going through need. You have the abundance right now at this time to help them. You know, the ta tables can turn. And also, and th their abundance also may become a supply to your want. They may have a time where they have abundance and you have want. Let there be equality. Even though it's not, well, we don't have a, a, a treasury. We, we just have, we don't have individual possessions. No, it's collecting there and equality. We, we have an abundance, we're going to help you. There would be times when we don't have anything, you can help us. And it was indeed in the, in the time of their need, not to continue on, but to help them in that time of their need. So there's a fellowship, there's a sharing. So I said, we're in this t together. Again, it's ministering to the saints in the ninth chapter, in verse one, for it's touching the ministering to the what? To the saints. He's writing to the church in Corinth. He said, you've been prepared, now you need to Get on with it. Verse 7 and 8, he says, what attitude of heart we should have. Let each man do according as he hath purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, or necessity, not put it in the plate because I have to. I want to. I'm helping a brother in need. The church is. And we're participating together through the treasury that has been accumulated. Not, not grudgingly or necessity, but God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make this grace abound unto you that you have always sufficiency in everything and abound unto every good work. That's our work. Benevolence. And that's what is happening in the local church. And we see we have authority for that too. Tells us, Paul tells us who it is because in Romans the 15th chapter, he's ready to go to Jerusalem. And what he says, he includes all of these churches, Macedonia and Achaia, He's con he has collected those with all the other men that the individual churches chose. He said, it had been the good pleasure of Macedonia. It's been a good pleasure of Achaia. We're talking about Corinth. To make a certain contribution. Who is it for, Paul? For the poor among the saints. Where are they located? At Jerusalem. So was the church in Corinth doing a work? They didn't maybe do it with their hands. They did it with their giving. And it works through the treasury of the church that there's the, how the collectivity can do a work as it is the church that's involved in doing that. But you'll see that in the New Testament, 
that the treasury was to be used to help fellow saints, out people out here in the world. And that doesn't mean we don't care. We just want to do it the way God said to. And we'll see how that goes a little bit later as we see the members who make up a local church at work. But benevolence is indeed a work that we do as a collectivity. And it's coming from us as a church, not as an individual. Individuals contributed to a common treasury. And that's what is taking place. Now, when we think about evangelism, that's another work that we're talking about. What do you mean? I'm going to spread the good news. That's something that God's people are authorized and encouraged to do, exhorted to do. That's what our work is. Helping the needy saints, work of evangelists, spreading the good news of salvation through the preaching of the gospel. How does a church do that? Don't all talk at once. Well, we go, let's all go together and we're going to go out here and preach today. No, we'll work through our treasury to accomplish evangelism. And so we see in the New Testament that indeed happened. Joshua read for our hearing about the church in Philippi. And notice if we see that church, it has its elders, it has its deacons. It is indeed a local body of Christians in the locality of Philippi. And he commends them about what they have done. And he re he rejoices in thinking about them. He says, for your fellowship and the furtherance of the gospel. The gospel is to be furthered. How can we do that as a church? Well, let's all get out here and let's go together. We're going to act as a church. Well, no, with a treasury. So the furtherance of the gospel from the first day until now. And say, so, well, how did they, how did Philippi church further the gospel? Well, we come to chapter four. And we read in verse 15, ye yourselves know ye Philippians, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no individual, no, no church, no church had fellowship with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but ye only, one church. And what they did, they sent once again to his need as he preached the gospel in other places. That's evangelism. How was the church involved? They weren't involved in furthering the gospel. How did they do that? Here's an example where their work was being, the work of and responsibility of evangelism was being accomplished through supporting that work in other places with the gospel. And they were sending that money to the preacher. They were giving, he was receiving. Was another institution between them? But it directly to the preacher. And they were having fellowship in the furthering of the gospel. The church was. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8, there were a plurality of churches that Paul was taking wages from. Wages from. No, it, he didn't call it benevolence. Yes, he had need. But he was earning that as a wage earner because he's preaching the gospel and he could be supported by the gospel. So Paul says, I robbed of the churches in the context where they said, well, he didn't take money from us. So there must be something wrong with him. And their idea, well, I robbed of the church. No, they, they gave freely, but he used that in the context of how the Corinthians looked at things. I robbed other churches. He didn't say I robbed other individuals. I robbed other churches taking wages of them, not benevolence, taking wages of them that I might minister unto you. And so here's one church involved in evangelism. Here are a number of churches involved in evangelism. Each church was sending it to Paul. There's no in-between man sending it to Paul as he ministered to the people in Corinth. Here are two examples, work of benevolence, and work of evangelism, where a church is involved and it's operating through its treasury. It's, re it's doing a work as it supports the gospel and it supports helping needy saints. But there's members in a local church, in a locality, that they are working individually. But it's not necessarily the church doing that. And sometimes it's distinguished between what they're doing. They, they're members of the Lord's church. 
In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 16, we observe that if one has a family member, for example, that is a, as a widow, and they're supposed to take care of that person. If any woman that believeth, there's your Christian, hath widows, let her relieve them, and let not the church, let not the church be burdened. So here we are, members of the local church, and you've got family members, you've got a widow in your family. You take care of them, believer. You, as an individual, distinguished from the, well, the church can do benevolence, but maybe that person's not a saint. Maybe that person's not a Christian. She's, you, you or her relationship with them, they may not be a Christian. Don't let the church be burdened. You take care of that. Again, Paul and God emphasize personal responsibility. He writes to the churches of Galatia, but he's applying things individually that we as individuals are to do good unto all men. That opens us up, all men, but especially them that are the household of faith. We just saw what we could do with the household of faith, people. We help them through our treasury. Individually, I have responsibility in this world that when there's an opportunity to do good for my fellow man, and I have the ability, opportunity, I do that. James 1, 27, that we're to oversee in the sense of helping the fatherless and the widows as we keep ourselves unspotted from this world of sin. That's individual responsibility. That's not church responsibility. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's, that's my responsibility and your responsibility as we have responsibility to take care of those in need. Not having a father, mother, not having a husband needing support. We can help them, but we do that as individuals. Darkus is a great example of a lady that was missed. Not because her intentions, is because of her deeds. In Acts the ninth chapter in verse 36, we'll find that Luke records about Tabitha, and her name is Darkus. And we realize that here she died but she was one that was full of good works and alms deeds. She was involved in benevolence. That's not the church. She is a member of the Lord's church. And here she was a disciple of the Lord. God had added her to the church. But this was not the church doing something. She had a responsibility in her life and she fulfilled it. She was making garments, coats for the, for, the, for the widows. So in verse 39, when Peter rose and went with them, he came down and they brought him into the upper chamber. They had washed her body and it was laid in the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by weeping and showing the coats and garments, which Darkus says, I plan to do that for you one day. What did they have? This is what she did. This is what she did for me. This is what she did them. It wasn't just good intentions. I let the church do it. No, is that here I have a responsibility. I'm a member of the church, but here I am involved in benevolence too. And while the church's treasury is going to help those who are saints, I can help people who are saints, and I can help people that are not. And she did that while she was with them. Don't put off good intentions because one day you won't be here. And what happened when miraculously Peter raised her from the dead? What did he do? He gave, he gave her his hand. He raised her up, calling the saints and widows. He presented her alive. Those widows, I present you darkest. What a moment that should have been with joy. Because she was known for her deeds. But here he was. It wasn't the fact, well, church is supposed to take care of all the benevolence. No. It's in our heart. It's in our DNA as a Christian. And I have responsibility to my family members, not the church. And I have responsibility to my fellow man. Even maybe members, I can do things that the church is not going to be involved in doing. 
Same thing with evangelism. We come to the local church that's been established in Antioch. Who established that church? It's interesting. In verses 19 through 21, it happened after the disciples in Jerusalem were scattered because of persecution. It's interesting how God's way of spreading the gospel throughout the world can happen at difficult times. They were being persecuted in Jerusalem, so they left. The apostles stayed back. But people, members of the church, like you and me, having to drive ourselves out of, out of this community because of certain circumstances. This was persecution of Christians. They went. And as they went as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to none save only to Jews. Well, who joined them? But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Gentiles, also preaching the Lord Jesus. Acts 10 has happened. The gospel is for the Jew and the Gentile. They know that now. And here is that gospel being spread by individual Christians. What church was involved in that? It's just people scattered. I'm a Christian. I'm involved in evangelism. Priscilla and Aquila in Acts the 18th chapter. They're just a couple. They're not the church. They had church meeting in their homes. They, they had a local church, places where they went. But here they were, the husband and wife, they're listening to an orator in the, the word of God. He knew accurately the things of Jesus, but he only knew the baptism of John. And it was the baptism in the name of the Lord that was current. And they took him aside and they taught him more perfectly. Well, let the church do that. No, here's individuals at a time when they could, they did it in a good way, taking him aside. They didn't stand in the audience and and try to disturb things. He wanted to be, he, need, he needed that instruction. Now, how he handled that, we're, we have to assume he handled it pretty well. Because <laughs> they say he, they, they encouraged people to, to come listen to it. But they, they, they helped a brother. Individual responsibility. We're involved in evangelism is in our heart. Paul had, exhorts the brethren in Colossae that indeed that they would pray for Paul, that's praying for evangelism. You, you can't maybe walk, walk the neighborhood. You can't seem to be able to, uh, to do a lot of things, but you can pray. And you can be involved in evangelism and help be in praying for those who are, are involved in directly that work. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer, watching therein with thanksgiving, with all praying for us also that God may open unto us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of the Christ for, I am all, that for which I am in bonds, that I may make it manifest as all to speak. Now, they could be having public worship and having prayers being offered for Paul to do that. But he's addressing this to people who make up that church. He said, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. How do we do that as a church? We do that as an individual. Let your speech, how do we do that? You, you find that, no, as of, in, as of individual, I'm going to let my speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that I may know how to answer. That ye, people who comprise the church, may know how to answer as you ought to answer each one. As we go about hearing this, dealing with this, promoting the cause of Christ, I can pray for the preacher. Now, I wish you'd pray for me that I may have open doors to, to teach and to preach. As you are finding your open doors, that we indeed can pray for one another, that indeed that will happen in our church. We can do that as a collectivity. We have one man pray that prayer. But I can do that individually as well. What I'm trying to emphasize, dear brethren, is that sometimes we put our money in the plate and the work of the church is over in our lives. Evangelism and benevolence continues because it's in our heart. We love the souls of men. And while the church may not be able to be there today, I'm here today with you. I'm here today with that person. And the work continues on. But we know that 
the church and its collectivity is involved in that as well. It accomplishes also to we accomplish this by worshiping together. And this is the third one, edification. Edification means that we're built up, encouraged. And so that could be a lot of ways we could be doing that. But the Bible tells us where we center our attention upon. And part of that is happening when we are assembling together. We're built up. Paul says, or the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, we're to be considering one another, not forsaking the assembling practice of assembling ourselves together. Apparently it was the custom of some already turning their back upon that. Don't do that. I'm considering my brethren. What work are y'all doing? I'm assembling. And things are getting ready to happen as we are involved in assembling together. It's going to be centered upon the word of God because, see, that's the basis of us being edified. Paul said to the elders of Ephesus, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. That's edification. And sanctify you in the faith. Set you apart from the world. We need a place to come as we worship God and be renewed. As we face the dark world of sin. And it's going to be based. I'm, I'm going to be built up not with entertainment. And I'm going to be built up with these things. I'm going to be built with the word of God. Because I want to be built up the way I should. We're going to in a local church in the Ephesus. You speak to truth in love. And you're involved in building people up. Each member, each member is involved in, in doing this. And notice what, what he says in verse 16. From whom all the body fitly framed and knit together, through that which every joint supplieth, according to the working and the measure of each several part, we're all involved in this together, set it upon God's word. We make the increase of the body, building unto the building up of itself in love. We're holding fast to the head, the source of our growth, his teaching. And we're speaking the truth in love. And we are contributing. Every individual is doing it. It's what's happening when we assemble together. The assembling of ourselves together. What we do in worship is how we are built up. What are we doing? We're singing, teaching, praying. And we realize in 1 Corinthians 14 that understanding was essential. Now, it's interesting, 1 Corinthians 14 is dealing with using miraculous gifts. We don't have that today, because in chapter 13, we have the completion of God's word. That which is complete, mature, perfect has come. And therefore, we, what we knew in part, now we know fully. And so it's different now for us, because we have the word, but we're centered on that word that was confirmed, that was coming through teaching. Songs were being learned as they were scriptural songs, how we should pray was being set forth in the praying, but all of that was to edify. And here was the problem. What if I spoke in an unknown tongue? I didn't know with, by miraculously, I can speak the word of God in an unknown tongue. That'd be enough to say, this man may be from God. But if you, the hurt hearer, did not know that language, you would not be edified. And that was the problem in the Corinthian church that Paul is addressing. So we see him speak. They say, well, we, we kind of like tongue speaking. What about prophecy? That's a little dull. You just prophesy and teach. Listen to what he says. Verse 3, but he that prophesieth speak unto men edification. That's what I want. That's what we want. That's, that's the work we're to be doing. Speaketh edification. And exhortation, exhortation and consolation. So he's preaching, I hear what he says, it's coming from God, and is setting forth that which builds me up, that says, this is the way you ought to go, exhorting, and sometimes comforting, counseling. You hear something that I need to put that in my life. I need to fill the gaps in my life. And preacher, thank you for filling that gap with what? The Word of God. That's why we teach the Word of God. Verse 12, So also, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may abound unto the edifying of the church. The church needs to be edified, and it's done through its members. 
first century when they didn't have the completion of the New Testament, it was these miraculous gifts. So we see in verse 14, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prayeth. He understood what he was saying. He says, but my understanding is unfruitful. No, preacher, you didn't understand it. No, he did. His spirit, he knew that. But his understanding is unfruitful. Follow with me. What do you mean unfruitful? He'll explain. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, my understanding, and I will pray with the understanding. Also, I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding. Else, if thou bless with the spirit, how shall he that filleth the place of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks? See, he knows not what you said. My understanding is unfruitful, therefore my brother is not edified. I speak in tongues. I, I, I speak Chinese. I never studied it. Well, I don't know Chinese. And my, so my understanding is unfruitful because the person that hears that. For thou verily give thanks well. You know what you were saying. It came from with you. But the other is not edified. Now, we don't have the miraculous gifts, but the principle here. If we do not understand in, in a language that's supposed to be presented, you say, we, all, we all know English. You may have to be parsing things together to make sense out of my English. I don't know. But we all know that. We, we don't have to have an interpreter. You go to a place, I've been with interpretation, you'll see one sentence and the other person's talking. And sometimes I didn't know what they were saying. I'm hoping they're doing exactly what I just said from the Word of God. But I found out later, they, they were using terms that are a little different. We had to, we had to kind of teach. We began to realize that when that happened. But when they understand, that's, we have edification. Now, my, our brethren are doing better about this, but I, I just want to make sure we have a lot of young men that are participating in our worship service and God bless you for willing to do that you're doing a great job but I want us to be reminded that in an auditorium of people you got older people and they don't hear as well as you do and how are we going to edify them well get them some better hearing aids well have you ever heard anybody's hearing aid goes up and down like that that's disturbing sometimes and it's difficult. So what should we, as young servants of the Lord, what, what can we do to make sure that they hear and understand and can be edified? We want to accomplish that. And the only thing I know to do is project. Well, i got a microphone here. But you still have to project. Have you ever been a quarterback on a football team? I think it's a good example. Quarterback has set to play, and he's going. He's called the count. How does he go up into the uh, go up and, and, the, and start to play? Because he he got to they got to work as a unison. They got to they got to work together. What do they What do they do? Do they just mumble, or do they have to project? Now I don't mean you have to project like Peyton Manning and say Omaha. But you know why he says that? Well, he does. According to him, he says three syllables. Hack the ball now. That's four. <laughs> Hack the ball now. That's what he said. Other quarterbacks said, no, he was changing the plays. He said, go back to the other one and go back to the first one. And all sorts of reasons. So he's got them confused. That's what he wanted anyway. Some say Jaguar. Some say Sally. Well, Jaguar's got an R in it, that's a run to the right. Sally's got an L in it, that's a run to the left. And they call it, sometimes it means, hack the ball now, <laughs> I need it now. <laughs> and it made the, the other team, they say, I don't know what, what place he's changing. Sometimes he's changing place, sometimes he's like, hack the ball any minute now, come on. But they know what it, they understand it. And quarterbacks don't mumble. I don't mean we'd shout, but to project, we're we're proclaiming something and we want the other brother to understand it and sometimes hearing is a problem in a local church 
I listened today, and Josh, we did a great job. And I know it's not easy because we don't feel comfortable doing that, but that's part of becoming a servant of the Lord and serving our, our brethren. But the point is, we want them to be edified, and they can't be edified if they don't hear and understand what, what is being said. If we're going to build a big congregation, we need seeker services. Well, God's already got one here in 1 Corinthians 14. Because here's an occasion where people are worshiping and they're exercising their gifts as we're revealing the word of God. And here comes a man that's a not believer. He's unlearned and he's not a believer. Chapter 14, verse 23 through 25. If he comes in and doesn't understand, because you're speaking in a tongue foreign to him, he'll think you're crazy. He'll think you're mad. But if, you, if everybody prophesied, meaning they could bring out the secrets of people's hearts and so forth, if they all prophesied in a language that they understood when they heard it, they said, God is among you indeed. And he'll fall down and worship God. Now that's a pretty good seeker service to me. You want to bring people in, modern denominationalism, you bring them in by a movie clip, you bring them in by an idea of a rock band, you get a seeker service, and then we'll filter out who's going to be regular members of the church. But you've got you to change things these days. You've got to bring people in to get a hold of them. Well, when we're involved with the community and when we come in contact with people, we invite them to church services. We invite them to, to service where the gospel is preached. We could be involved in evangelism, but notice... It was the word of God penetrating the heart of people that caused them to say, God's among you indeed. And they worship God. Our local assemblies, what we're doing on a Sunday, can be very much involved in evangelism. And what do we do when we take the Lord's Supper? We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Disciples, and on the first day of the week, that's what we do. Every week as a first day, we're here. And we remember the Lord's death. And what we do, we proclaim. It's like we're preaching something. We're not hiding it. We're proclaiming he died on the cross. Men thought that was horrible. It was a horrible death. It was shameful. He despised shame. As he saw the joys of heaven and pro providing for salvation for mankind. We proclaim the Lord's death. What are we doing? People might ask the question, what was that all about? It's about his death. Did you know he died for you? You know, we serve a risen Savior. He's coming back. And we're going to partake of this till he returns. Because he's alive. But we remember his death. It's an opportunity for evangelism. As we build ourselves up in our, in our common faith. The New Testament church is at work in benevolence in evangelism and edification. That's what we do. And all the things we do together, according to Scripture, we're singing, we speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We pray. We give up our means. They take the Lord's Supper. And you hear a sermon. Preached. Paul preached at midnight. I quit. Because I think this is what we need to take home with us and to be involved in realizing this is our work and let's put our heart into it. our heart should be in evangelism and helping people and i want to build this church up what can i do they can start with our young men in public worship as they sometimes have to get out of a comfort zone because the purpose is i want everyone to hear and understand what's being said so they can be edified this morning, if you're not a member of the Lord's church, you haven't come to Christ, we want to encourage you to obey that gospel while you have the opportunity. Many in Antioch, they, were, they turned to the Lord because of the gospel, and the Lord added to the church daily such as we're being saved. That comes through spreading that gospel. If we can study with you, we'd love to try to help you see the gospel. If we can help you in any way, come forward as we stand and as we sing.